number one, but there is strong scientific evidence to back your decision. And this is very important in hypospadial surgery. surgery. Uh, I would like to welcome both of them, very distinguished uh, speakers for today's meeting. And we have uh, uh, moderators for our session from uh, Turkey and European uh, representative of the UFAPS, Cenk Buchanel, and from uh, India and the uh, Asian representative of the UFAPS, Shilpa Sharma. Both of them have uh, a, a huge interest in the field of urology and hypospadias, and both of them have invited uh, Warren Snodgrass uh, to some uh, meetings and workshops in the past. So we start with a quick uh, welcome by Cenk Buchanel, and then we'll move on to listen to controversies and common myths in hypospadia search. Cenk, please go ahead. I think Art will be slight. Are you able to see it? I'm sharing it. Okay. Can you see the slides, Jenk? Sami, are you able to see? I did. Okay, let's try again. Yeah, I can see the slides of uh, maybe uh, Nicole need to stop sharing so that you can share. Uh, Nicole, if you can, yes, please. Yeah. Can you see yeah. it now? Yeah, I can see okay. it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, may okay. I have the other one, please? Other side. Well, I like this Durham Simmons saying, there is nothing new in surgery, not previously described. All the techniques have been mentioned at the end of 19th century. Next slide. <laughs> For my point of view, Hippo technique is not the major contribution of Warren. I think Warren brought a meticulousity in hypospadia surgery and importance of aesthetic appearance. And these two items even more important than Hippo, I think, because he brought a aesthetic and meticulosity uh, philosophy in hypospadia surgery. For Nicole, I would like to mention that with her uh, tremendous efforts about evidence-based studies and long-term follow-up TIPU series, it's outstanding. So she enlightened our uh, way to see what's going on hypospedias. The next two slides are related with workshops. So this is from 2002 meeting in Istanbul. Unfortunately, David and Howard is not with us, so we can see uh, Warren and Larry and Ahmed there. And next one. Next slide. And this is a very funny slide from Kosovo meeting from 2007. You can see Warren with the special cap of Kosovo. So these are the memories that I can remember. So I would be very happy to see Nicole and Warren. Thank you very much. So it's a pleasure for us to be here the, for us early this morning. And we hope our computer connection stays. We've not had trouble before, but we did earlier. So this is our new center we opened a year ago almost. And so hopefully one day when people can travel again safely, you can come visit us here. So we'll start. First, we just wanted to get some audience participation. So hopefully you can put up the first question so that you guys uh, can answer. And what we want is just what best represents your personal view about hypospadias repair. So Choose number one, if you think that all hypospadias repairs are cosmetic. Choose number two, if you think all mm -hmm. distal repairs are cosmetic. Number three, if you think some distal repairs are cosmetic. And number four, if you think that 
proximal repairs are not cosmetic, but distal ones would be. Just whatever best suits your mentality. Or if you think that number five, no hypospadias repairs are cosmetic, then choose that one. So we'll give everyone a few moments to fill this out. We're really curious to see what everyone has to say. Look how fast that's tallying, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. It's faster than our US elections, that's for sure. <laughs> this is more democratic. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> we need to put some votes in the trash. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So about half of you guys have voted. Oh, now we're getting a few more. I think, yeah, I think there's too many choices. <laughs> we have five choices on almost all. I'll give you guys a few more moments to finish. Looks like we're slowing down of people answering. So really kind of equally spread all throughout in terms of um, what people think and for cosmetic surgery. For oh, no, wait, though. If you add up just our cosmetic, you have 24 and 11 and then another 30 something. So the majority of people are saying that some aspect of hypospadias is, is cosmetic, is mostly cosmetic. So we can go with that idea. All right, so we're gonna end the poll and let's see. Now everyone's viewing the results. So there you go, just to, as Dr. Snodgrass said, some people think there's some aspect of cosmetic surgery for distal hypospadias repairs in the majority of cases. <clears throat> so we're gonna move along from there. So I'm gonna take that off and move forward. There we go. So okay. let's narrow it down to this patient. Does, he, does this patient need to have a hypospadias repair? Please. Quickly answer. There's the answers. I wonder if we have absentee balance for this. <laughs> This is fun. This is a whole new topic for us that we created just for this meeting and for you guys. Um, and it's been a lot of fun for us to um, talk about things that we really haven't spoken of in public before. Um, but he and I have discussed a lot. So um, these are new answers that we're getting from you, which is good information for us to have. And hopefully you'll get some good information uh, from our insights from this lecture about what we think some of the most common myths are in distal hypospadias. So this is it's interesting for us because we hear a lot of people who look at this sort of patient and say, well, you can have it fixed if you wish, but it would be cosmetic, basically. We hear that quite a bit. And it's interesting that that's not what most of you are answering. Most of you are answering that no, two, almost two thirds of you are saying that there's a functional reason for this, but we can go on. Okay, and, and this is kind of fun because it's like the identical patient now all grown up. And I happen to have a video of him urinating. And so, as I say, there's quite a bit of dispute in our side of the world about these distal cases, and not in part because most of our colleagues never see an adult. And so you don't see what their life is like. Look at how a stream is going straight down at a 90 degree angle. And just watch for a moment. Now as he finishes, look at what all happens. 
So he deals with this every day. Spring, you saw two streams, and then at the end, it kind of went everywhere. And so that leads us into this whole topic. And, and you may not be aware of the myth buster idea. That's a television show that maybe you've seen or not, where they take a, 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 a statement or an idea, and then they examine it and say, well, is it true or is it actually a myth? So we decided to use that same principle to look at some aspects about just distal hypothesis. So we'll start. And we're going to start with this myth that distal repair is a cosmetic operation. Take you through our thoughts on it. So the background, as we've already alluded to, is that we hear lots of parents and lots of doctors refer to distal hypospadia surgery as cosmetic. And these are actual quotes that we've gotten from patients or that we see on social media, online. And it just comes all over the place where you say, it's really more cosmetic than actual surgery. Or I feel bad because my son had cosmetic surgery when he was just a tiny infant. So it's very common throughout the language that we see that parents are using. And we also hear lots of surgeons using the term cosmetic. Well, and even publications talking about cosmetic results of hypospadia surgery. That's right. I mean, we use that word, but we're going to examine that word. So when you think of cosmetic surgery, what comes <clears throat> to mind? At least here in the United States, this is something that comes to mind. This was a, a series of billboards that were all over Hollywood. If you went to Hollywood over a 10 year period, you saw this lady, Angeline, you didn't know what she did, but she was on huge billboards all over Hollywood. Another Hollywood um, set of people are the Kardashians. And, and so I think when people think about cosmetic surgery here in the United States, this would be another one where many members of this family have had every body part you can possibly imagine operated on for cosmetic purposes. So what about this? Is this cosmetic? So if you really look at just especially an incomplete, but even a complete cleft lip, it rarely causes problems with feeding, the hearing loss, speech problems that you see with cleft palate. And in fact, even the plastic surgery literature says that cleft lip is largely a cosmetic issue and that it doesn't really affect the development of the patient like cleft palate. But when you see this gentleman, you have to wonder if this cleft lip affected his development in any way. I mean, has he dated? Has he kissed girls? What, what exactly has transpired in his life? And I think that we would all agree that at least for that man, it's much more than just a simple cosmetic issue. And that really brings us to what I wanna talk about today, which is the difference between cosmetic surgery and reconstructive surgery and our use of those terms. So the cos uh, cosmetic surgery has actually been defined by the plastic surgeons and it's performed to take something that is normal anatomy, but it to be something
just lost uh, them. So we're just waiting for them to log on again. Uh, it should be a second or two. Can you hear us? Hello? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't see us, but we're going to go ahead and continue. Slides. Can you yeah. hear you? No, you can share the screen once more. Okay. I don't see you guys. That's not what we want. We are so sorry. We have done multiple Zoom. zooms from this exact spot with no trouble i don't know what's maybe it's in our region i don't know We're going to try this one more time and see if we can make this work. Is everybody there? Yes, we can see the okay. presentation now. We are so sorry. It's an internet issue <clears throat> at our end, even though We've never we, have no, I, no, we have no idea why. <laughs> okay. So we're going to move on. So what we were uh, in the midst of saying was that hypospadias is clearly a birth defect. There are um, st structural issues and functional issues uh, that are both involved, which we've shown in patient reported outcomes. When patients have reconstructive surgery, such as these babies here, of course, we can all see that they would have improvement in their body image, their self-esteem, and improvement in their function and structure. And that's gonna be true for something you can clearly see like a lip and in body parts that you can't see. This is a woman with a lumpectomy and one with a bilateral mastectomy. Just because people can't see these body parts for them doesn't mean that it's not important to them. And for many women, of course, their breasts are something that is part of their womanhood. And I would venture to say that most people, at least most men, think of their penis as something that's very much an integral part of their manhood and that the appearance and the function of it are, of course, going to be very important as well. So successful hypospadias repair has been shown to improve patient satisfaction with how things appear and functional issues as well. Of course, cosmetic surgeries can do that too. If you Google cosmetic be surgery before and after, you see all sorts of pictures on the internet. And it's been clearly shown to change body image and self-esteem. But the big difference is that you're not taking something that has an abnormal function. It's normal to begin with. And I think for this reason, cosmetic surgery has a very negative connotation. 
there are quotes in all over the literature that talk about words that people use when folks undergo cosmetic surgery and things like vain or neurotic or even entire segments on whether or not cosmetic surgery is a sin are very common themes that we see. So I think one of the things we're trying to emphasize here is that we shouldn't use the word cosmetic to say what we mean when we're talking about the appearance of the penis, because the word cosmetic is associated, whether it's just mentally or in print that people have seen with all sorts of negative connotations. And this is really important because parents already have a lot of guilt and shame because their baby was born with a birth defect. There are multiple studies that show that. So we really want to make sure that the words we're using don't enhance some of these negative feelings that parents can already have just because their baby was born with something not right with their penis. So it's our duty to provide factual information. It really is our duty to, to use correct terms. And of course, we need to acknowledge that the penis is a body part that's just as important to that boy as lips might be to the man with cleft lip or breasts might be to a woman breath with breast cancer. So really recognizing that our words matter, I think is very important. So when we say is hypospadias repair cosmetic surgery, in this regard, we're gonna say that's a myth. It's not cosmetic, it's reconstructive, and we shouldn't use the term um, cosmetic to replace appearance or aesthetic outcomes. Yeah, and so it's interesting because, of course, we don't know what the audience's point of view is before we poll. So I'm a little surprised that meant that fewer people answered cosmetic than we anticipated. But this is a huge issue in the Western world, at least uh, our part of the world, because of the um, activists with the intersex societies and all who are trying to label much of this surgery as cosmetic. And we reinforce that when we say to parents, when we mean appearance and we say cosmetic, we're falling into that same trap. So that's the reason that we're trying to make this point that as a society, we've got to move away from talking about cosmetic when we mean appearance. Or aesthetic outcomes. Yes, aesthetic outcomes. All right. So let's move on to another myth. Well, maybe it's not a myth, that's the question. So we know that testosterone grows the penis and the question is, does it also reduce complications for hypospadias surgery? And just a, a word of background, the first person that we know of to use testosterone in a patient was Culp, who was a general urologist at the Mayo Clinic. And they brought this patient to him, a boy who had had several unsuccessful repairs. He apparently took one look at it and said, well, you got to give him testosterone and make his penis bigger for that to work. And, and it did. And so then the conjecture came that, well, maybe if we give boys testosterone, they'll have better outcomes from surgery. Yeah, we should yeah, also say that the first patient had a complication from that, but we've tended to brush off this problem with pubic hair and all as insignificant. So, and we know after that, there were a series of papers that were published that showed that testosterone grew the penis. But we all wear loops. We can see. Do we need? Do we need the penis to be bigger to do our work? And the real question is: If we give testosterone, are we going to improve the results of the hypospadia surgery? That's the key question. So, why Another don't you give us a quick answer? Tell us what you think. Would you give testosterone to this boy who has distal hypospadias? Just see what people are doing. So this has started out at 100% and is gradually going down some. And Trump had all these votes and then Biden's votes came and took them away and Biden ended up winning. We trust uh, on medicine more than in um, <laughs> <laughs> politics. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
Well, it's obviously very fresh on our mind. They haven't even called all the states yet from our last week. So, okay. Is this so official? Most official? Of you, yeah. Most of you wouldn't, but yeah, about 20, a little over 20% of you, almost a quarter of you would give testosterone for this patient. And let's go on. What about, yeah, what about that patient? A more severe looking hypospadias, same question, same options. I'm going to put up the new poll in just a second. There we go. Now you can answer. It's so wild watching this thing, is it? I'm watching the stock ticker or something. And not surprisingly, we see more people, in fact, let's see where it's going, but at least half or over half of you are choosing to give testosterone in some fashion. I'm going to share the poll with you here. That was with over 100 resp uh, participants responding. So there we go. Now let's move on. So even though most of you didn't use it for distal, a quarter of you did. And so I'm just going to make the point that in, as far as I know, the person who most advocates for that is Mark Zayantz. And he just recently had a publication in our literature about making this statement that testosterone decreases complications or could decrease complications. Y'all have heard this at the ESPU a number of years ago. He spoke about this same topic and he also um, had a, a lecture at our um, AUA two years ago where again he made this point that testosterone helps and might decrease complications. But even now he's writes that they're still looking at the results of that. Even though he's been talking about it for yeah. five plus years. And even though he doesn't know his results, he says that they're what you read here and claims that there's no negative effects from that and, and therefore concludes that it's an important part of surgery. So, I, you know, it's fair enough when it's published, it's fair enough to talk about things and see, well, what, where does all of that go? It's interesting to operate based on feelings instead of actual <laughs> outcomes. That's something we would try to avoid, generally speaking. <laughs> so there's, so the question is, so we just did the little poll here, but is that representative of what people do? And I don't know that there's much information about that. I found this publication, but you see they had an extremely low response rate. Only 27. Yeah, so that's 10% of United States pediatric urologists who answered the poll. And you see that in that poll, none of them happen to do it for distal repairs. So we surveyed the hypospadiology email group and you see that most people responded that they wouldn't treat this patient, but, but a few people did. And so then we looked at the more severe ones and just as in the poll in the United States, you see that there were more people and in the poll this morning, and that added up to about two thirds of people would use testosterone for so this very patient. Similar. Yeah, so very similar. So now that we have that background, let's look at the results. And we're just going to focus on the report by Luis Braga, of the meta-analysis of published studies that was published about three years ago. And you see a large number of patients, and the final analysis was that it didn't make any difference. But he looked over here and said, well, there's a few studies that said that it could make a difference. And when he looked at those, those were RCTs. And he concluded that, well, RCTs have better value than just, you know, retrospective studies. So let's look at those. There were a couple of them. And here's the first one. This is a study from Austria and they showed a significant decrease in complications that they attributed to the dihydrotestosterone that they gave. And if that's true, shouldn't we be using it more routinely? If that's true. 
But there's also this larger series that didn't show a difference. And since Luis's publication, there are two more all on distal repairs, even though most of us answered, we don't do testosterone for distal repairs, all but one of the RCTs, which have been published, were on distal repairs. And it very much depends on your baseline rate of complications as to whether or not you can see a difference with the number of patients you have. So a 24% baseline complication rate for distal hypospadias is, is certainly not ideal. It's hard to imagine that just putting on some cream that the rest of us in the world with DHT cream can't even get made the difference. But if it did, they haven't continued that. This was an old study and we haven't seen those results, other replications. We'll just say briefly, our experience with boys with proximal hyperspace, you've heard us say before that we segregated it by size of the glands, and these boys with the smaller glands got testosterone, but didn't just get it. They got it until they reached a target size. So that's what's different in our study and other ones where just a predetermined amount was given. We treated until we measured that size. So the boys in both groups were the same when they underwent surgery. And I did all of the operations on them and did the same operation. And as you see, despite getting the glands bigger, they still had significantly more complications. And that's why we quit using testosterone. We could grow the glands bigger, but it did not improve the results. So that falls into line with all those other studies on distals that also didn't find that it improved results. Well, does it, it, you know, that's the evidence. We can't find good evidence really that it improves this, but does it do harm? And there are, there are studies. She's looked at these. I've looked at it a lot. And testosterone mm -hmm. itself in animal models and in multiple human wound healing studies has been shown to impair or have a negative impact on wound healing. That was certainly what our data showed too. So we, you know, yes, we can grow the penis, but are we doing that at a cost to the patient when it causes more keloiding and hypertrophic scarring? And of course, you know, again, I mentioned before about side effects. It's commonly said, well, th there's not very many and that they just go away. But that's not what we see in boys who come to us who've been treated with testosterone. Th this is a child. And look at this beard, for gosh sakes. This is a six-year-old boy right here. So, you know, it is not rare and it's not transient and it's not insignificant. So, yes, you grow the penis, but we're not finding evidence that you reduce complications by giving testosterone. Now, our lecture today is on distal hypospadias, but we threw in the question about proximal on this, and most people answered, or at least two thirds of you answered that you would give it, and we used to too, but you see now why we don't, and that's why we bring this topic to you to maybe give some more thought. It's a knee-jerk reaction for many people when they see a proximal hypospadias to recommend testosterone. But we haven't used it now in over six years on any patient. Yeah, and we have lots years. of perineals and, and scrotal patients. But let's change topics and do another survey to keep you all interested. So here's a patient and, and we're curious about what surgery you would do for this patient. Tip, G-tip, a two, urethral advancement or a magpie. So we'll put the um, questions up and you guys can answer that briefly. There it is. Here, I'll get it. All right. Wait, 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 give me a second. We've had 33 seconds. Okay. So 
We're going to end the poll here and share the results with you. So it's half and half, basically, right? So several different options here, and about half chose tip and half chose something else. <clears throat> all right. So some of you have perhaps, well, all of you should be aware of these recommendations that you shouldn't do tip if you have a narrow plate, which is what that boy had, or a quote, unfavorable urethral plate. So let's look at that and see what the data says. And I'll just say, let's go back historically. And this is what the first paper, I mean, I wrote that. And, and I said that the deep, the key step was making that deep incision so that we get an adequately sized neo-urethra. And in that first paper, I happened to characterize the urethral plate as like that patient I just saw, he was, would be flat or cleft. None of them had that really deep groove in that first series. And it happened that none of them had a complication. Well, then a bunch of other people whose names you know, put their data together and we published a second paper. And again, we didn't sort out patients who could and couldn't have the surgery. As far as I know, they just did it on the patients who came in with distal hypospadias. And that's what Earl Chang basically published in, a, in another multi-center group, a large series of patients with a very low complication rate and not one word about having to select carefully patients to get the operation. And then we carried that on to this step where we didn't use, I have not used a different operation for a distal hypospadias on a single patient for now almost 30 years. So we said we used it on everybody and we didn't find a contraindication. And, and because of this article, the editors of the journal, when they published it, made this comment at the, at the beginning of the article. But there have been people who've questioned that. So Graham Smith published this paper saying that a narrow urethral plate, again, that's what the patient that I showed you was less than eight millimeters, would have a higher risk for complications. And he said that he did the operation exactly as we described. He made the deep incision. We que I questioned that and published a letter to the editor about that. But then subsequently, a group closer to y'all in Mansoura published a similar paper that said that if you have a narrow plate, that the complication rates are significantly higher. And anticipating that I would write a letter to the editor, they just went ahead and answered it and said, no, this is the effect of the anatomy, that it's that narrow plate that caused this to happen. It's not technical factors with the operation. They did the operation right, and these are the complications they saw, and the problem was the anatomy. So let's look. Here's the picture from their article after they incise the urethral plate. And here's a picture from our article after we incise the urethral plate. And I think you can see that there's a big difference in the depth and extent of those two incisions. In fact, it was very easy because they put the measurements in there. So half of their patients had a less than eight millimeter urethral plate. Ours were even more. We had over 85% that had small urethral plates in our series. But when they incised the plate the way they did it, they increased the average about 57%. When we incise the plate the way we do, we increase it more than double. So there's a huge difference in terms of how wide the plate is getting based on how deep you cut it. And it's clear based on the pictures and clear based on the numbers that even though they thought they were incising it the way we have described, they weren't. So that makes a big difference. And then in the meantime, even if we kind of question about width of the plate, my good friend Pippi 
is going around telling people, well, but if you have an unfavorable urethral plate, and then when we pin him down and say, well, tell me what an unfavorable urethral plate is. Well, he tells us it's narrow. Well, we just mm -hmm. talked about narrow and has poor spongiosum. And, and so he and I have been having this conversation for several years. So I'll just ask you, which of these patients, if any of them, have an unfavorable plate? And do we have to do this? Do we have to go through and make these judgments to decide what to do? Because here's a meta-analysis of all the published results from a couple of years ago. And again, no discussion about patient selection in that. And you see that when you put all the data published from around the world together, that it averages out to over 90% success. So that's what Operation We, we do would do and have done for a very long time now, without exception for distal patients. And we wouldn't do a G tip. It's less of an issue if you want to do that, but we just thought we would show you. We've seen several patients who have had dehiscence after the G tip, and that um, that graph that was put in there gets all. Um, uh, edematous, as you see here, and then looks quite unsightly. So a, a word of caution, it's not innocuous to add a graph there in some patients. So do you need to identify patients who, based on anatomy, should not have a tip repair? And again, the data says, no, we, we don't. As long as you incise it, Deeply, deeply so that your width is doubling before and after incision. There is not a patient that we don't incise the urethral plate on. And so if you're not incising it all the way or deep enough, that's where you have to worry about problems. All right, one more, I think we got two more questions for know. you. So why do problems happen after hypospadias repair? And this is kind of a fun one too, if we haven't asked before. Was it the wrong surgery for that patient? Is it bad patient anatomy? Was it wound infections or something that happened post-op? Is it technical error or is it problems with the bandages? A catheter or something like that. Yep. We'll take a moment and answer that. So we're running kind of a neck and neck race between making mistakes or doing the wrong surgery for the anatomy. That seems to be the biggest two groups. All right, it sounds like 65% of y'all have voted. So we're gonna end polling and share the results with you here. So as you can see, about a, a third and a third said those things. So let's talk about it. That. All right. So here's our discussion point that hypospadias repairs, distal repairs are successful 95% of the time. This myth, true or false? So let's talk about it. So there's, of course, the meta-analysis that we talked about that showed about a 5% complication rate. We think that's probably where this quote comes from. The problem is that some people can achieve that, but others might end up with results like this. These are all distal hypospadias patients that ended up as cripples. And when we look at our hypospadias cripples defined as patients who have failed multiple surgeries, 20% of them started life as a distal hypospadias. So when things they can go wrong in these patients. So this is good data. Dr. Bush was a part of this study, helping them set this up. So in Holland, they put together their major centers and they um, accumulated data on, you see a very large number of patients. So these are the major surgeons in Holland doing distal hypospadias repairs and all of their results 
tallied on the same data sheet that then is With presented here. With standardized complications that we define. And what you see is that only 10% of, of the surgeons at the major centers in their country got that 95% that people routinely tell their patients, well, when we fix distal hypospadias, there's 95% success. In fact, their average was a 16% complication rate, so markedly above that. And unfortunately, a small percentage of their surgeons had more than 40% complications for distal hypospadias, not proximal distal repairs. So this kind of data, to my knowledge, doesn't exist anywhere else. But based upon what we see in our practice, I, there's no doubt in my mind that if we did this study in the United States, that we would get similar data back. So we can say that, yes, we can be successful 90 5% of the time, but the data, the, the data that's available there says that we usually don't do that. So, so we'll give that a part yes, part no. It, it is true, but it's not true. <clears throat> All right, so now we're gonna move on to a related issue. Why do complications happen? And so we wanna see whether or not it's true that complications happen because surgeons make mistakes. So how of you just answered that that's true and half of you just answered that that's not the major reason for mistakes so let's talk about it and in fact those of you who answered the other most of you said well you, the person used the wrong surgery for the anatomy of that patient that's what john duckett taught that's what i learned so this algorithm for deciding what to do with a distal hypospadias mm -hmm. was developed when I was a resident with Gibbons and Gonzalez. <clears throat> and you see for this subcoronal meatus, this was the thought process. And let's take out the ones with curvature and look at these over here where the penis was straight and they had these characteristics. If the glands looked like this or that, if there was a meatal variant, whatever that was, then what you did. So this is how I personally learned to an, analyze distal hypospadias and decide what to do. But you could even make it, in my time, you could make it even more complicated than that because there were other repairs that we didn't do in Houston. And if you throw them all together, it could get quite complex. And again, if we go back to this and say, well, how do we apply meatal variant, narrow glands, unfavorable plate, how do we do that when we look at a series of patients? And we have a hundred and something people on this Zoom. If we went through every single one of these and said, who thinks this is favorable? Who thinks it's unfavorable? It would be chaos. And we know that because Hippie's group did that study <laughs> for us. And let's just say that there was absolutely no infrarader agreement. So that means that, that people, even very experienced pediatric urologists, can't agree on what they call favorable and unfavorable when you just put a whole bunch of things up. When we, you know, our practice is only hypospadias and half the patients who come to us have had a failure of surgery. And in the United States, all of these cases are done by certified pediatric urologists. So we get their records and we just look to see, well, what did the surgeon say? What happened? What'd they do? And, and we read these kinds of things. So, you know, it wasn't anything the surgeon did. It was this. Which Constipation caused, or yeah. that they, mom just didn't watch the kid. He was too active. So here's what we find. So remember that slide I showed just a minute ago from the 80s that they had that branch over there for distal with core D and they treated that with a transverse island. Wow, there's nothing new under the sun. I think we started with that quote from Chink today. So here we are. Here's a boy with a very distal hypospadias. It sure looks like something you would do one of your preferred distal repairs. Oh, except he's got curvature and people look at that meatus and fix this with a dorsal plication so they can do a distal repair. 
our data says that's not the right way to do it. And interestingly, that's what my mentors all those years ago said too. They didn't say dorsal plication and then a magpie or whatever. They said transverse island. We'll just take out transverse island and put stag or stack there. The other thing is not doing, you select the right operation. We think tip is the right operation, but if you don't do it right, well, then you're going to have complications. So doing the wrong operation because of curvature or doing the right operation, but not doing the key steps correctly, that's what causes complications. That's what we see over and over because we read the operative notes. So look at this for a second. And if you're doing a tip repair and you see something on here, that's how you do it. We would say you're making a technical error and therefore you may be having complications over that 95 or 90% 90 success that could be fixed. And again, we'll emphasize the two most common most severe ones is not tipping the entire urethral plate and not tipping it deeply enough. That's what we see over and over. I think people have worried that they would create scarring and in that worry by not doing it deeply enough, they actually create tension when they bring the urethra together. And it's that tension that can cause the wound dehiscences and the fistulas and even stenosis issues. Yeah, some of you have been to recent world meetings about hypospadias and all, and people have made comments that TIP has complications in this and that. Well, there's the reasons why right there, because if people don't do it right, then they're going to have complications. So again, if you do it right, then all of us can achieve over 90% success. If you don't do it right, then you'll be an outlier like the, like the Dutch showed us. So we think that most complications come from a surgeon doing the right operation the wrong way with some coming from choosing the wrong operation. So what's the answer to that? Finally, yeah, we have a true we have a true answer. Yes. And that that's really an important message. We hope everyone will think about that because how we look at it when we see a patient with a complication, the first thing we do is go back through their notes, look at the took and everything and say, did we make a mistake? Should we have done something different than we did? When we see a patient who was operated on by another surgeon, we always ask for the operative reports. We always read through them, again, looking for mistakes. And almost always they're there. So again, all of us should look at our own practice and say, am I doing the operations in the best way? So, so what have we learned? Let's sum it up with our mix. So hypospadias repair is reconstructive to fix abnormal anatomy. We don't call it cosmetic and we don't even use the term cosmetic. We use appearance or aesthetic outcomes. Testosterone, we don't find any data that it improves results. And there's it, lots of data that it can increase great. hypertrophic scarring, which is a problem on the penis. So we advise you not to use it based upon that, even for proximals. Tip repairs can, can fix all distal as long as there's no ventral curvature there. You don't have to worry about the width of the plate and whether or not it's unfavorable or favorable. And we should have all of us, all of us can achieve that result. All of us can do it, but it means looking at how we're doing it and being willing to say, I was taught by a very good professor, but maybe I wasn't taught exactly the best way to do this step. We have videos that, you know, we're not saying that we do it best than anybody, but we have 95%. So you can at least look at what we put out on YouTube and compare what you do. And instead of just saying, oh, well, I don't like to do it that way. If your results 
If you have higher complications than that, well, well, maybe you should. If you have 90 plus percent success, then however you're doing it is fine. And if it's published that, yeah, maybe let we can us learn know. from you. I think that's why it's so great to have videos like we do now. And if, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, finally, when we see complications, just assume that it's a technical problem that you're making as a surgeon. It's what we do. It's how we publish what we publish and why we keep up with the data that we do because we all want to do better for our patients and make improvements with each surgery that, that we do. So thanks for inviting us again. We're sorry at the very beginning we had an internet problem and we're very relieved <laughs> that it didn't happen again. <laughs> of the lecture and we hope you've been somewhat entertained and maybe a little bit challenged by the information that we've given today and again this is this is our place now this is where we work and um, certainly you can come to visit us in the future hopefully not terribly long from now and in the meantime you can contact us by our emails um, you can contact us through our the hypospadia specialty center and, and again, we have this group that all of you are invited to participate in. Just send either of us an email that you would like to do it, and we will add you to the roster of people. So again, thank you for inviting us. And now I think we maybe still have some time for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Warren and Nicole. A truly outstanding presentation and a true Miss Buster. <laughs> because I used to watch the, the TV show and so, I, know okay. what, <laughs> I know what it means. And this, I can see it in front of my eyes. You are truly busting a lot of myths. <laughs> the problem, this uh, myth are, are very widespread. Yes. And it's everyday business. And if you look at the discussion, you will see a lot of uh, people still discussing and arguing on many of them. So we need yes. a lot of effort to to bust them uh, more. So congratulations. Uh, it is backed, um, dear friends and colleagues, it is backed by, by two very strong things, experience and evidence. So it's very hard to, to argue against this uh, statement and this summary, very nice summary of the end on the pitfalls and uh, we see it every day in practices. Unfortunately, till now, uh, hypospadias, as I said, the 300 operations, still we see complications, see hypospadias, cripples, and are striving to get the best result. And the only way is to follow this, what has been said today, experience and evidence. And if you have a better uh, results, then tell us how, how you can do it. Publish it, post a video, and let's learn from each other. There's a huge amount of questions, actually, in the <laughs> chat area. So we try to summarize. We'll take 10 minutes with Jink and 10 minutes with Shilpa and try to get uh, the representation of what the audience think about this uh, talk. Jink, can you start, please? That's fine. Yeah. yeah, you look at the chat area and pick up some of the questions. Mm -hmm. Can you stick it? Okay. Uh, Jenka, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm looking the questions. Yeah. I can pick up some until you you uh, select yours. Some question from Hakan about local DHT cream may be required in some severe 5 alpha reductase deficiencies. What do you think? Well, that's a totally different question, though, isn't it? So the only boys we have seen with 5 alpha reductase deficiency have a tiny penis. And that's why those boys, in, in as, as we know, the penis at puberty group, they're raised as girls and maybe not even diagnosed. That, that's what we've seen. We've not seen boys with the typical hypospadias, even proximal hypospadias, that have come back with 5-alpha reductase deficiency. So, and, and to my knowledge, there's nothing published about that showing 
the type of proximal hypospadias that we did in that one picture and saying that that's 5-alpha reductase. I mean, nobody would look at that child and say, oh, well, that's a girl and raise them as a girl. The ones we've seen, they look, I mean, we're talking about less than five millimeters. Just and, tiny penises. So. And unfortunately, here in the States, we don't have access to dihydrotestosterone cream, so we don't have experience with that. Our, our families that we know have really struggled to try to get access to we, it. We can't get it from Canada. We can't get it from Mexico. And when people have tried to get it from Europe, they've run into all kinds of hurdles to do it. Mm -hmm. So we can't answer the question but I think that very, very few boys diagnosed with hypospadias have 5-alpha reductase. What we don't know is whether or not there's a difference in wound healing using dihydrotestosterone yeah, versus testosterone, but no one's answered no one that knows. question. So, Do you have dihydrotestosterone in Egypt, Sami? Yes, we have. Yeah, so we don't have it. Yeah. Maybe we'll have you ship us some. <laughs> of course. I'll give you a good price, don't worry. There you go. <laughs> okay, Jenka, are you ready? A question yeah. for Pataknar. Uh, what yeah. was the period of testosterone application for glands to grow from under 14 millimeters to over 14 millimeters? Wouldn't any infant penis grow similarly? The question so, is this. Of course, we all know the infant penis grows with the mini puberty that happens around six weeks. And there have been studies, are, we showed, multiple other people showed it, that the, the glands width will grow between the ages of zero and three months. And then from the age of three months up to about 10 years, you're not going to see any change in the width of the penis. A little bit of change in length, no change in the width of the penis. So what we're talking about are boys after that three month period that we saw that we measured in the office at less than 14 millimeters. And what we found is that, you know, that the typical uh, testosterone injection thing is to give two milligrams per kilogram at um, one month intervals. So that's what we see times three. And so we started off doing that and found that some patients actually grew to 14 after a single injection. Other patients didn't grow to that 14, even after all three injections. So then we changed our protocol where we would give the injection several weeks later, remeasure. And then if we needed to increase the dose a little bit, go from there. And all that's been published. You can take a look at our, at our paper. So ultimately, we found that the proximal patients needed more testosterone than distal patients. And even with that, when we got them to the desired size, they had more complications. We had the same size penises that we operated on in the same way, but the boys who got testosterone had a higher complication rate. And so that, that's when we stopped using it. That somebody's asking, what was the age of these boys? And the mean was uh, nine months. And the last dose was given uh, usually four to six weeks before their surgery. People have talked about whether timing is an impact or not. In our database, if they've ever gotten testosterone, there's a higher rate of complications. So that's just what our data shows. The, my, my part, the last question will be from Dr. Manoj Josi. Uh, what are your views in long-term results when this incised ureter plate heals and caliber narrows? Does it re reduce caliber in this patient with narrow ureter plate? Well, are you asking, do these patients at a later date return with meatal stenosis or urethral stricture? And the answer is no, and not just in our data, but in published data. In fact, there's a study out of Canada where they did uroflows in patients after TIP, MAGPIE, and MATU, and they followed them into puberty. So they had oh follow-up in boys after they oh finished their growth. And none of those boys, not the TIP, not the Matus, not the Magpies, they didn't come in at a later date with obstruction. So if what the takeaway that we is if you do the operation right and the patient heals without a complication, the odds that you're going to see a future problem is extremely low with TIP repair or graft repairs. Flaps are a different thing. But the Matus, Magpies, and Tips all did fine with long-term follow-up. 
Somebody similar asked what the secret. A similar question was on this was does it affect the vascularity when you give a deep incision? I think we have lost their connection. Frozen. Uh, Nicole, can you hear us? Technology has got its uh, pitfalls again. So even in uh, some parts of the world, there is a slow connection or interrupted connection. But we are lucky that you could finish the whole presentation on time. So we'll wait uh, for them to reconnect. Meanwhile, Sami, you can give your experience with testosterone use. Have you used it in DSD patients, proximal uh, hypospadias? Uh, well, as, as a, a very common belief in many parts of the world, if you have a proximal hypospadias with a small penis, uh, me and uh, many others have the impression that giving testosterone will increase the size and vascularity and probably will improve the results. This is an assumption, but it, this needs to be backed up by true evidence. So uh, what's very nice about the, the uh, uh, conclusion of uh, Nicole and Warren is that they made a, a, a comparison between cases which have received testosterone and those who didn't and reached the same uh, gland sweats. And it's shown that complications are more in the cases using testosterone. So I used it for a while, but I stopped based on this evidence. The complications may also depend upon the time of surgery after testosterone use. So some people prefer to wait for two to three weeks after the last application so that it doesn't affect the results of the surgery. What do you say on this, Snodgrass? Well, that's what uh, Dr. Bush answered, that we, our typical was once they reached the right size, then we did surgery generally within four to six weeks, and our results were what they were. It, it didn't, I mean, it decreased complications. It decreased them to 30%. I don't know if they would have been higher if we'd operated the next day. Uh, when I met you first in 2005, the question I asked you was at it's Istanbul, Turkey during the first World Congress on Hypospedias and Intersex. I had just finished my training then. So the question I asked you was, how deep do you go? And you had told me that I go deep enough that I know it's not going to bleed anymore. So it's kind of a sub-epithelial thing. I think you've gone deeper over the years. And I how do you prevent maybe... any bleeding? I'm sorry, maybe I didn't express myself clearly. I was pretty young in those days and figuring out how to answer questions. The tip incision that I make has always gone down to the surface of the, of the underlying corpora. I've always done it that way. And so, and, and does it bleed? Usually not, usually not. But I do the incision with the tourniquet on and then we take the tourniquet off when we put the catheter in just a moment later and, and they don't bleed. So the key thing is that the mistake that we see because I explained it poorly originally answering questions or because people have been afraid to incise it or afraid that's gonna create a problem, whatever reason, we should always cut the plate from inside the meatus the end of the plate down to the corpora. That's what we do. That's what we've done forever. And so you can trust us or not, but what we publish says that that works. And what and we see with experience is that when you don't do that, if there's tension on anything in hypospadias, chances go up dramatically that it's not going to heal correctly. So when you don't deeply enough, fear of creating scarring and stenosis issues, and then you put a catheter in and close it where it's a little bit tight, you actually may be creating the very problem that you are trying to avoid. And any uh, recommendations on the post-operative care? How long do you leave the catheter and the dressings you want to apply? That's a question in the group. Yeah, well, we're happy to answer it, but let's also say that that probably doesn't make any difference in distal hypospadias outcomes because you don't have to leave a catheter at all. We leave one for one week, but, but that question 
it is a common question but that doesn't impact the results there is a question about what size and that could impact results we have always used a six french dripping stent because of course we're not sewing the urethra to six french sides we're sewing the urethra as wide as that plate is which is usually 12 millimeters or wider so that's a 12 french or wider urethra we leave a six french stent because we don't want any tension on what we have just sewn up so people who are using an eight or even a 10 or something along those lines. I don't know your results. You'll have to look at your results to see if you're having more problems with stenosis because it's creating tension from using the bigger catheter or having more problems. In there is another question on whether you mobilize the proximal urethra for proximal hypospedia surgery. Yeah, yeah we're not, we haven't talked about proximal surgery. So the, the, the short answer to that is I used to and I stopped and I published not to do that back a decade ago because it, it, doing all of that led to some strictures and recurrent curvature. So I'll summarize in one sentence, we almost never do a proximal tip anymore. We only do it when the penis is straight or less than 30 degrees curvature. And there's not many boys with proximal hypospadias that fit that category. So we don't do tips. I mean, in a year, we do a couple. No, not even. Yeah, we do a couple a year and we do proximal hypospadias almost every day. We do a couple of a year. There's a question from Dr. Ramesh. A uh, lot of studies are going on with caudal anesthesia. Do you think it increases the complication rate of hypospadias? Uh, not at all. I've reviewed one of those studies multiple times and kept turning it down because the statistics you really poor. Um, so uh, there's just not evidence that that's the case. Um, we use basically every single patient that we deal with, unless they're too old to put a caudal in, and our anesthesiologists can usually get caudals in up to about 10 years of age. So we don't see that difference. We've had a discussion with the anesthetist on this. So when they increase the volume of the anesthesia to more than 10 to 15 ml, it does cause vasodilation. So you, you may encounter more bleeding during the surgery, but we still need to see whether it really leads to complications later on. It does increase the vascularity of the field. How You're using a tourniquet, so maybe you don't uh, feel that. How, how you, often does, does a caudal take more than 10 cc's? So they, they have done it in our centers, some of the anesthetists, the younger ones, they sometimes tend to increase the volume. So if we decrease the volume, then it's fine. So it should not be more than 10 cc. Yeah, I was going to say, we don't really watch when he's doing it. No, Back with COVID, we're out of the room. They usually quantity or something that makes it longer acting with less volume. With, yeah. I think he uses one syringe. I think he uses 10 cc's, our anesthesiologist. The last question is your experience with hypospedias without cordy. We haven't talked about it. Without what? I'm sorry? Without cordy. Cordy without hypospedias, you mean? Cordy without hypospedias. Oh, okay. without without hypospedias. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll have to tell some that he has to invite us for a Zoom at another time to <laughs> wade into that thicket. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about proximal and cordy next yeah, time. Yeah, we could do that. We could do that for sure. Okay. There's been a lot of appreciation. Everybody's very happy with your talk and everybody's learned a lot. You've left many questions in everyone's minds. Thanks a lot. Well, and again, you know, we're, we're happy to continue these discussions and um, people can email us or, you know, go to our video sites and we're happy to to answer questions as we can. And a lot of our post-operative instructions are online. So people are asking about ointments and how long we leave catheters and things along those lines. We have really detailed patient instructions that y'all are welcome to access on our, our website, hypospadius.com. So it's easy to remember. Thanks. Again, thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. All Sam, right, are you we... sharing your screen? Uh, yes. Um... Uh, actually, it has been very enjoyable, as usual, highly educational. You touched on very um, controversial issues, but the <laughs> message is clear, as always, from Warren and Nicole. There is clear evidence that, uh, and clear uh, suggestion. 
I have a suggestion for the depth of the uh, urethral plate incision. I don't know what is your opinion, Nicole and Warren. When I used to teach, I love this operation a long time ago. And uh, when I used to teach it to um, our trainees, I say the minimum depth that gives you the maximum width. You are applying traction on both sides of the plate by tooth forceps. And you apply, as you incise, you gain more length, you incise more. At one point, you gain no more width and you reach it the maximum. So it's uh, the minimum depth that gives you the maximum width. I don't know if you agree or not, but it's easier to remember. Well, I think when you get to that point where it's no longer wider, widening, that that's yes. the same point where exactly. I think that's another way to say the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. What I learned trying to teach, you know, usually I worked with first or second year residents was that if there was any spider webby looking tissue that you need to go deeper because when you're all the way down to the corpora, it's a smooth surface. There yeah. really isn't anything more to cut. If you yeah. still see spider web tissue in there, you can cut deeper and you'll, it's so fascinating when you really get used to feeling those tissues, you'll feel that it increases in width but it also seems to increase in length some, just releasing some of that little bit of tethering tissue. And, and so I think that making a deep incision is really a critical part of the surgery to release all of those tissues that may be tethering and, and that should have zipped themselves up, but just didn't when, when things are rested in their development. Yeah, we have no doubt that some of the guests that you've had in your center and that have spoken in congresses around the world talking about complications from TIP, from patients they've seen, that that has come because this original surgeon incised deeply enough. Not, not that it didn't heal right, but that it was never cut right in the first place. So that's why we're really emphasizing that. And we said this morning as we were having coffee, we've got to shoot a new video and really, really, really show that because there remains 25, 30 yeah, years later, still questions about that plus doing a tip repair when there's more than 30 degrees of curvature and okay. not doing a tip. No, when people do it, yes. that's a major complication. And 30 degrees is only about this much. It's yeah. not yeah. very much. We clearly were not estimating curvature correctly before we started using a goniometer. We would call something like 45 degrees, 30 degrees of curvature. And it's just wrong. It's too much tension on the tissues. So being aware of those two critical points, don't tip when you've degloved and there's still... 30 degrees or more and if you are going to tip inside I think those are the biggest take-home points and don't use the word cosmetic <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you're giving the whole talk again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love the slide when you have summarized the pitfalls because actually it gives a, a, a huge message I think every surgeon should put it in his clinic to remember all of these pitfalls because it happens every day yeah. So again, a uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Get ready for CORD and uh, proximal hypospadias okay. soon. Sure. Uh, who knows, maybe it will be physical this time because we need to shake hands and uh, yeah, come sure. meet you in person. But uh, we enjoy it. Thank you so much. We had a wonderful crowd today hitting the, the uh, top line of 200 uh, viewers. So it will be on the, our YouTube channel and it will be on the Facebook. Thank you all for joining us and stay tuned and watch the Mistbusters on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>